worst military mistakes. The result of miscommunication, overconfidence, incompetence, ill preparation, or sometimes just pure stupidity, the history of warfare is littered with embarrassing blunders, atrocious mistakes, and calamitous gaffes, perpetrated by hopeless halfwits claiming to be commanders of men. As the following events will illustrate, not everyone was born to lead. Operation Tiger with D-Day looming on the horizon, from December 15, 1943, the U.S. Army commenced preparations for a series of rehearsals known as Operation Tiger, penciled in for late April and early May of 1944. Slapped in sands, an unspoiled beach situated in Lime Bay, featuring a shallow lagoon and tall cliffs, was chosen as the practice site, since it was very similar in appearance to Omaha Beach in Normandy. Here, American troops were to get a surprise taste of the turbulence yet to come. On the evening of April 26 to April 27, the main landing force, replete with minesweepers at the front, set sail across Lime Bay. In order to safeguard the fleet from fast German e-boats that commonly patrolled this particular area of the English Channel, some precautions had been carried out beforehand. The man responsible for the safety of Operation Tiger, British Admiral Moon, had perceptively sent out his own wave of scout vessels to loiter around the German port and e-boat base of Cherbourg, where a lapse of concentration would soon lead to tragedy. Plymouth safety measures seemed to have worked at first, as the bombardment of Slapton Sands and the landing process went by without a hitch throughout April 27th. However, in the early morning of April 28th, the main convoy was suddenly peppered with missiles from a squadron of nine e-boats from Cherbourg that had somehow evaded detection. Without receiving any warning from the scouts, the U.S. ship LST-507 was torpedoed into oblivion within a matter of moments, while only a short while later, LST-531 was destroyed and sunk in six minutes. With the survivors swimming for their lives in the freezing waters of the channel, the battleship LST-289 hoveredly returned fire and rushed back to port after also being hit, while the other LSTs and a British corvette continued to fight back against the assailants. Using smoke to cover their tracks, the German e-boats zipped away as fast as they had arrived, leaving in their wake 749 dead or missing servicemen. Hey, Simple History fans, I've got something epic to share with you today. Have you ever dreamt about being a ruler of a grand civilization, leading armies into war and carving your name into the annals of history? Well, you can do exactly that in Rise of Kingdoms. This is a truly immersive cross-platform strategy game where you can experience real-time team battles through various historical eras with more than 60 million users online worldwide. With an expansive open-world environment, you can enjoy customizing the architecture of your civilization, even exploring and conquering new lands. You can play with your friends on any platform, as this game is cross-play compatible. The latest update brings the civilization of Greece right to your fingertips. If you're obsessed with the Peloponnesian War, you're going to love the exclusive Greek commanders at your disposal during this event. But that's not all. Rise of Kingdoms is kicking off their Civilization Clash event at Rock Dock Games. This is your chance to represent Greece or many of the other 13 civilizations, engage in thrilling battles and make your civilization the greatest in the world. And the best part? You can win amazing prizes, like an Apple Vision Pro. So get ready to strategize, ally, and battle your way to glory. So what are you waiting for? Download Rise of Kingdoms and represent your civilization. Let's make history together using the link in the description or scanning the QR code on the screen. Don't forget to use the promo code GREASE4ROK to get 20 silver keys if you're a new player and enter to win the Apple Vision Pro through the multi-civilization event available at Rock Doc Games. See you on the battlefield, soldier. Conquer with Greece. Rise to greatness. The Battle of Crete. On Tuesday, May 20th, 1941, a German invasion force consisting of 750 glider troops, 10,000 paratroopers, and 5,000 mountain infantry launched an attack on the island of Crete. The mission objective being to capture several airfields on the northern coast so a firm foothold could be established. Following an intense air bombardment, the first wave of Germans were dispatched to Malem in the northeast of the island. Over the next few hours, this and other contested areas would bear witness to one of the greatest airborne disasters in German history. 
Firstly, since the Enigma Code had already been cracked at this stage of the war, the Allies knew every detail of German strategy before they had even deployed. Armed with such useful intel, thousands of additional Allied troops were sent to Malem, Raythemnon, and Heraklion to set up strategic positions in the exact places the Germans were planning to drop. As a result, as German gliders and paratroopers floated down, most were mowed down by strategically placed Allied guns. The situation was made even worse by defective German gear, mainly the parachutes which had several problems. The principal issue was that they had been produced without shroud lines, meaning that German air personnel had no way to control their descent or landing. This design drawback, coupled with the violent swinging motion that arose as the canopy was activated, caused the soldier to spin helplessly out of control, meaning many of their ranks were killed as they performed wild mid-air pirouettes. On the ground, the situation was equally hopeless. Because the Germans' weapons had been sent down in separate containers, many of which had been captured by the Allies, any surviving soldiers were unable to get their hands on a gun. Forced to defend themselves with only pistols, knives, or their bare hands, the Germans were so weakly armed that they started to be attacked by a local Cretan civilian population, wielding pretty much anything they could get a hold of. As soon as they landed, many German paratroopers tangled up in their harnesses were immediately knifed or clubbed to death by enraged locals, equipped with an unconventional assortment of pitchforks, walking sticks, and outdated Turkish weaponry. The glider troops fared no better, being torn apart by mortar shells as soon as they hit the ground. So great was the slaughter that a company of the 3rd Battalion 1st Assault Regiment had 112 out of 126 men killed by the end of the first day. Surprisingly though, despite the awful start, the Germans eventually went on to conquer the entire island. However, with around 4,000 of their troops killed or missing by the end, it would prove to be only a Pyrrhic victory. British Invasion of Spain a leftover from colonialism, since 1704, the British have laid claim to Gibraltar, a tiny coastal exclave in southern Iberia that has historically stoked tensions between the UK and Spain. However, because Gibraltar itself is minuscule, being only 5 kilometers long and 1.2 kilometers wide, and because most of the residents identify as British, this long, drawn-out diplomatic feud has never really threatened to spill out into open conflict. It's pretty clear, then, that no side would benefit from a full-scale war over what is essentially just an occupied rock, and that it would be incredibly stupid for either power to make a move against the other. Yet that's exactly what happened in 2002, when the UK, albeit accidentally, invaded Spain. The fiasco started when 20 British Royal Marines on a training exercise, disoriented by bad weather and sailing in a landing craft launched from the HMS Ocean, disembarked on a beach they believed to be in Gibraltar. Hitting the sand, the platoon brandishing SA-80 assault rifles and 60mm mortars took up defensive positions to prepare themselves for mock combat against fellow British soldiers. Yet instead of coming across a squadron of their own countrymen, the men were surprised to find a startled Spanish fisherman who pointed out to them that maybe they were on the wrong beach. The Marines were then spotted by two equally perplexed policemen who informed them that they were actually on San Felipe Beach in the Spanish town of La Linea and not in Gibraltar. The mistake was confirmed by a quick survey of the area and the notable absence of the massive 1,398-foot-high Gibraltar rock. Having accidentally invaded Spain for about five minutes, the platoon made a hasty retreat back onto the landing craft. While the British Military of Defense offered their sincerest apologies for the debacle, the mayor of La Linea could only praise the citizens who staunchly defended the national sovereignty of Spain on that fateful day. They landed on our coast to confront a supposed enemy with typical commando tactics, but we managed to hold them on the beach. Charge of the Light Brigade On October 25, 1854, in response to a combined British, French, Ottoman, and Sardinian bombardment of the strategic port of Sevastopol, the Russian commander, Prince Minshikov, decided to storm the British base at nearby Balaclava, setting the scene for one of the most disastrous military blunders of the 19th century. As the Russians swarmed the ridges surrounding the port taking many Allied guns, Minshikov's forces began to ominously close in on the Allies, who regrouped at Balaclava determined to keep themselves in the battle. 
After repulsing waves of Russian sallies, Lord Fitzroy Somerset Raglan, the British commander-in-chief, ordered his cavalry unit composed of heavy and light brigades to recapture the guns. More specifically, Raglan instructed the commander of the cavalry, George Bingham, Earl of Lucan, to mount an immediate charge against Russian positions with the infantry to follow up behind for support. However, in the pandemonium, Raglan's instruction became muddled. As a result, instead of swooping towards the foe as required, Bingham instead told his units to disengage and to wait for the infantry. Perplexed that his instructions hadn't been carried out, Raglan issued another directive, urging the cavalry to advance rapidly to the front, causing even more confusion, for Bingham could not see any Russians in the distance. Now completely baffled, Bingham asked Raglan's aide-de-camp, Captain Nolan, where his regiment should attack. In one simple gesture, Nolan sent them to their doom by incorrectly pointing to the North Valley instead of the causeway. Despite expressing misgivings and concern, Bingham organized 670 members of the Light Brigade for the task at hand anyway. Led by their unit commander, James Brudenell, who was also Bingham's brother-in-law, the Light Brigade began their mile-and-a-quarter charge and were almost instantly set up upon by Russian fire from three sides, with Captain Nolan the first to fall. Exhibiting incredible bravery, the survivors who had somehow managed to get behind the Russian guns regrouped, and to the astonishment of the Russians, continued to advance, causing their own cavalry to fall back. The enemy were now on the run, but because Bingham had already ordered his heavy brigade to retreat, the Russians soon realized that the light brigade were now totally isolated and outnumbered. The Russians now funneled down into the valley where the remnants of the light brigade were gallantly making their last stand. Amazingly, two groups of survivors managed to break free of the Russian encirclement, staggering back to safety all the while being pounded by relentless Russian artillery. In total, 160 men were injured and 110 were killed, meaning the casualty rate was a sickeningly high 40%, while around 400 horses also lost their lives. Sadly, like many other similar bloodbaths that spatter the pages of recorded history, the charge of the Light Brigade was a completely avoidable calamity. It's just one of a catalog of catastrophes that will forever be blamed on bumbling officers, bungling generals, and blundering emperors that didn't have the requisite skill, courage, or tactical acumen to lead their men in the proper manner. Battle of Adwa in 1896, keen to reassert authority in East Africa after a disastrous colonial campaign, Italian Prime Minister Francesco Crispi ordered his underperforming Generalissimo Oresti Baratieri to wage an enormous offensive against the town of Adwa, where the rebellious Ethiopian monarch King Menelik II was believed to be holed up. Despite the army being woefully underprepared and unable to even resupply, Baratieri was overruled by his other generals who were confident that the Ethiopians, despite their greater numbers, were inferior and could be easily defeated. Dividing his force of 20,000 into four regiments, Baratieri made a fatal error when he instructed his left flank, commanded by General Matteo Arbatoni, to rendezvous with him at a hill called Chidamere. Baratieri didn't realize the map he had given to his officer was incorrect, and the actual location of the meetup point was actually five miles further. The Italians couldn't even march to their own demise in the right direction after the inept General Abertone accidentally headed west instead of north, bumping awkwardly into the forward brigade led by General Giuseppe Armandi, who had to tell his men to halt in order to let Albertone through. Reaching what he thought was Chedan Mere, Albertoni didn't realize that Armandi was now seriously behind after the delay, meaning his own unit was now isolated from the others. In the wrong position, completely cut off and exposed on both flanks, Albertoni foolishly ordered his men to assault a 30,000-strong arm of the Ethiopian army. Finding themselves outnumbered, seven to one, and unable to call for assistance, within a matter of moments they had been decimated by the enemy artillery and skirmishers, and Albertoni had been taken prisoner. The forward flank under Armandi fared no better, with the general himself killed and the majority of his comrades massacred by Ethiopian horsemen and sharpshooters. 
As Baratieri ordered an immediate retreat, the 3rd Brigade, overseen by General Vittorio da Bromida, miles from the action and unaware of the situation, had some success repulsing enemy assaults until the next morning. In the afternoon, however, da Bromida and most of his 4,000 comrades were slaughtered after being encircled and set upon by 50,000 warriors. In total, 6,000 Italians were slain and 3,000 were taken prisoner. The Battle of Caranceves Following a series of great military victories by the Prussian King Frederick the Great, in 1788 the Austrian Emperor Joseph II pledged to outdo his rival on the battlefield. Opting to choose the Turks of Transylvania as his target, Joseph rode there with his army. The hapless Austrian monarch's first mistake was to set up camp in a malaria-ridden swamp against the advice of local guides, leading to the deaths of 33,000 of his entourage over six months. His contingent now weakened, Joseph would next have to face a Turkish army heading straight for him. Mustering what was left of his disease-stricken forces, Joseph led them to the town of Caranceves, setting in motion a series of events so unbelievable they almost defy belief. It all started when a brigade of Austrian hussars crossing a bridge decided to reward themselves for their long trek by buying liquor. But when the infantry joined them to wet their whistle, they were driven away by the arrogant horsemen who did not want company. Furious by being deprived of much-needed alcohol, the infantrymen pretended they were being attacked by firing their weapons in the air and crying, Torzi! Torzi! in the hopes that the hussars would scatter and leave their booze behind. Instead, the hussars were roused from their drunken stupor and, taking the threat seriously, started firing off rounds themselves, thus setting off a fatal chain reaction. Startled by the gunshots in the distance, the rear regiments panicked and began shooting at each other in the dark. Officers ran up and down the lines desperately shouting, Halt! But in the noisy chaos, their orders sounded like Allah, only adding to the hysteria. Convinced that the entire Turkish army was upon them, the baggage handlers and transport workers to the rear drove their wagons right through the heart of the brawling mass, running stampeding men over and knocking them into the river like bowling pins. The Emperor Joseph was among those bumped into the water as his crazed men shouted forlornly, The Turks are here! All is lost! Save yourselves! By morning, dozens of Austrian servicemen had either been killed or wounded in an orgy of self-inflicted carnage that had been set off without an enemy Turk in sight. The Battle of Red Cliffs during the late 2nd and early 3rd centuries, as a result of nomadic invasions and the outbreak of the Yellow Turban Rebellion, a general uprising against rampant social inequality, the Han Dynasty disintegrated, causing ancient China to fracture into a series of warring regional states. In the north, after many successful military campaigns, the Chinese warlord Cao Cao of the Wei clan became the greatest power in the region, and casting his eyes avariciously on southern China, he vowed to unify the country once again under his overlordship. To achieve this, though, Cao Cao would have to cross the Yangtze River and vanquish a coalition of southern leaders consisting of the Shu and Wu clans. With an army of close to 250,000 soldiers loaded into ships behind him, Cao Cao followed the Han River down until he reached the waters of the Yangtze. Coming across the famous Red Cliffs, Cao Cao tied his fleet together with chains, ordering them to anchor up stern to stern for stability, thus forming a near-solid wall of vessels. As many of his men, unaccustomed to the swampy terrain of the south, succumbed to disease, Cao Cao commanded his regiments to establish a bridgehead across the Yangtze, but the battle was indecisive. It was after this that the southerners cooked up a dastardly plan that would take advantage of the unusual way Cao Cao had parked up his flotilla. Soon afterwards, a Yu officer by the name of Huang Gai pretended to defect to Cao Cao's side. His surrender accepted. Guy came to meet Cao Cao at the other side of the river with a group of ships jam-packed with a highly combustible mix of dry reeds, wood, and oil. At about halfway, Guy and his crew aligned them so that they were directly in Cao Cao's path, set the ships on fire, and jumped into boats behind them to escape. The burning vessels smashed into Cao Cao's armada and ignited his stationary naval force. 
Unable to move because of the chains, the ships were incinerated one by one. As the flames blazed through the floating huddle, causing men to jump into their watery graves, many of the land positions and horses were also set alight. In the bedlam, the southern clans pounced, finishing off the remnants of the northern army who were forced into an ignominious retreat along the Huarong Road, during which many of the fleeing infantrymen were crushed under the hooves and heels of their own horses and comrades. <laughs> 